Welcome to Fosbury Flop, a podcast for the crazy ones who are not fond of rules. A podcast about the geniuses who change the world. Will Coelho be the Fosbury of Padel? May God free us from being orthodox. In this post, I have put the words and Robert Ristovsky, the quality. Thank you for your help, Robert. History is changed by those who don't find balance when and where everyone is stable. Even if we point out to individual beings as being guilty of innovations, we should recognize the part of blame that the context has. It might change everything. The context changes the stability of behaviors, makes them possible or impossible. Context decides whether the behavior will persist, how much it will last, or how quickly it will decay, and switch to some other behavior. Dick Fosbury is noted as the creator of the Fosbury flop in Haisham. Without a context in which soft landing surfaces began to be incorporated, previously the landing was on hard surfaces, he would not have been able to explore and find new ways to overcome his discomfort by jumping with scissors style, avoiding the standard straddle technique. Could it be that the creator was thick, but the culprit was the context in which he was in? Currently, in Padel, Arturo Coelho has achieved walls number one, following Dick's example, succeeding in the opposite direction to what many label as right or normal finding his stability far from the status quo. Many blame of this the peculiarity of his individual constraints. A height of 1 meter and 90 centimeters and a discomfort at the back of the court where all his professional colleagues can play comfortably, just like Dick. They are right, a lot in fact, but without a context that made Coelho feel uncomfortable and stable, he wouldn't have had to explore and find a new way to succeed in paddle. He has found himself in a context where most players were stable, but for him, the normal way of playing generated instability. He could not have successful performance on a regular basis. Coelho had to find the stability, consistent functional performance in other ways, and has ended up reaching the world number one paddle with an unorthodox style. This has made me formulate an unpopular opinion. Arturo Coelho, unintentionally, can be able to end up creating a big tsunami in how Padel is played, as Dick Fosbury did with Haisham. But could it be in both cases that the creators have been Coelho and Dick, but the culprits are technological innovations and the quality of their opponents? So, the context they were in? Everyone laid the jumper as a madman, a black sheep. In fact, the coach, Python Jordan, said, Kids imitate champions. If they try to imitate Fosbury, he will wipe out an entire generation of high jumpers, because they all will have broken necks. Time proved Dick right, though. I don't know if the same will happen with Arturo Coelho. It will be quite difficult for him to achieve the same importance as Fosbury. What I do know is that the paddle player has been able to reach number one of the world by doing two things that no one had ever done before. First, play successfully in the middle area of the court, a space in which coaches often forbid players to be. It's supposed to be a transitional space in which you should not stay. That's why they call it no man's land. Second, Coelho has created and consolidated the backhand smash when he's close to the net. It's a shot that no one had ever tried before, no one had seen it being trained, no one had posted any tutorials on YouTube. This makes me wonder if Coelho can be the Fosbury of Padel. Why? Although the essence of the game is different, Padel is a sibling sport to tennis. It has the peculiarity that the court is a little smaller and is surrounded by glass and fences. This results in players having a second chance to hit the ball after it has hit the wall, as long as it has not taken the second bounce in the floor. 
Paddle coaches usually separate the zones of the core into three. Back part, close to the glass, behind the service line. Front part, close to the net. And no man's land, transition area, between the front and back. The main idea is to be able to be in the front part most of the time. It's easier to make points, control the opponents, and avoid mistakes. To achieve this, it is necessary to survive in the back part of the court until you have a chance to counterattack, usually with a deep lob, and run to the front part. If the lob is not deep enough, the opponents will hit the ball before the bounce and come back to the front part. In the written version available at Fosbury Flop that blog, there is an illustration with the zones of the core to understand the traditional padded logic. A very good example of this traditional and common style of play is Federico Cingote, a short player wearing red. From the back, he is able to resist, survive as much as necessary until he finds an opportunity to send the rivals back and go to the front zone. Check it out in the written version of the post. Okay, understood. Now, in the same situation, we change Federico Cingotto for Arturo Coelho, the left-handed player who wears black. Here again, there is a video of Coelho playing in a situation similar to Cingotto. These are video clips from the last season, and you don't need to be an expert to see that something is wrong. You can see Coelho's partner, Fernando Blasteguin, 16 years in a row, number one of the world, following the traditional paddle logic, like Chingoto, and looks like he has everything under control. Looks like Velasteguin and Coelho are two opposite poles. The former had a stable performance under the traditional paddle logic. The latter, Coelho, didn't even know where to start. Following the status quo, Coelho is supposed to be in the back part until he can counterattack. But he couldn't follow this traditional paddle logic because before he had any choice to counterattack, he had already lost the point. He didn't survive. His performance wasn't stable. He couldn't find solutions. His behavior wasn't functional. Arturo Coelho failed to have stable successful performance regularly in the back part of the court. He had to explore, forced by the context, other forms to look for new solutions in order to have functional performance in the paddle court. The survival of a behavior in life and in a sport is dependent on stability. In the back part of the court, the only stable behaviors that Coelho had were the ones that caused him mistakes, the opposite of what he needs to succeed. In absence of stable performance, Coelho could be seen anxious to cross the line and approach the net to see if he could find functional behaviors to stabilize in that part of the court. If you have been around for a while, you will know what it's a complex system. You will call me tiresome if I repeat that we are not machines, complicated systems, but people, complex systems. The behavior of a complex system, Coelho is an example, appears as a result of the different conditions that exist in him and in the environment as his habitat. Coelho as every player, consists of many cognition action components, which interact among themselves and also as a whole with their environment, teammate, opponents, climate, balls. As we have said, the existence of a behavior is dependent on its stability in a specific context. The player tends to explore for environments where the strength or synergy of the system's components is stronger than the intensity of the perturbations from that environment. The high competitive environment where Coelho competes perturbs him through the game. The perturbations that Arturo Coelho had to face while playing traditional paddle were stronger than what emerges from the interactions of the components of his system. They destroyed the interactions of his cognitive action system, his successful performance. The more the system so the player is stable, the larger the perturbation is needed to beat him. It is not the case of Coelho. As his behavior wasn't stable, no big perturbations from the opponent, shoots, moves, were needed. If the perturbations of the rivals were challenging, they would make Coelho stronger. Since they were of an unbearable magnitude for him, 
they kill him. Taleb explained it very well to us with the Hydra, the Phoenix, and the Sword. If a behavior is perturbed and is not affected, recovers quickly, or even grows, it is robust or anti-fragile and can succeed. If it doesn't recover or dies, it is fragile. When Coelho was placed in the back part of the court, was fragile to perturbations. He couldn't negotiate the shots played by his rivals. The perturbations were stronger than he could bear. The behavior, even if we coaches force it, will be destroyed by the context. But this also has benefits, and it surely helped him become number one. They forced Coelho to explore new ways to achieve his goals. The back part of the core was, maybe it still is today, a repeller for Arturo Coelho. That is, a place where the functional behavior of the player is unstable. As a mountain top is for the water of a river, when Coelho is in that place, he tends to leave it spontaneously and converge to the attractor. When it rains, the valleys are attractors of all the water that comes from the sky, areas where they tend to end up fluently. Where is Coelho's attractor? Far away from the back part. Coelho needs to play his own paddle, not the traditional paddle, the one everyone plays. Maybe he could play it when he was competing at under 18 or under 16 with players of his age. The perturbation of the rivals did not pose him a problem for him to play traditional paddle as they do now when he competes against the best players on the planet. He is the same. The context and its perturbations, no. A change of context can make a previous stable state unstable. Change his opponents from players of his own age to the best players in the world, and you will see. Oello was faced with the need to find a style in which he could successfully deal with perturbations in the highest category of world paddle. It was time for positive feedback. In the middle of an unstable moment, the components of the Coelho's complex system underwent a rearrangement to adapt to the new context. His cognition action components found an attractor in no man's land, a place in which causes forbid you to stay, but where his system tends to have stable, successful behaviors. In video format, it is better understood. The video is available in the website fosbury.blog. You can see how, as soon as Coelho can, he tends fluidly to move towards no man's land. It is a pleasure to see how he can successfully play in an area where, in theory, nobody should be. Thank God that the solution has not been to improve his individual technique with isolated drills, repeating the defense execution, feeding him balls from the basket to make Coelho fit to the textbook's model. Each player has a characteristic landscape of attractors, repellers, and bullies that conditions their path to success. If the player's landscape leads the water to a certain state, it will cost a lot to go against it. Through training and constraints, we can modify the geography of each player. We can help to create new attractors and repellers that change the stable, successful behavior of the system. But it's not us, the coaches, who decide. It's them, the players, who adapt. Why don't Coelho, like Fosbury, achieve his goals by following the footsteps of those who did it before him? Because the behavior depends on the context the player is. The context, the person in that specific situation, made it impossible. The behavior is determined by key constraints from Coelho and the environment in which he is in. A constraint is a limitation on the degrees of freedom of the complex system. It guides and influences its options of behavior. A constraint can be personal or environmental. Both are important in the case of Coelho and Fosbury. The different constraints in the context of both did not give any option to follow the tradition. 
different personal and environmental constraints made them achieve their purpose in an unorthodox way. Their context was unique. Who and how they were and where and when they competed. It also required a unique response. They had to be up to par. Copy-paste wasn't worth it, or even possible. The height of 190 centimeters is a big personal constraint for Coelho. In paddle, this big body helps him in the front part, but makes him suffer a lot in the back part. It is so much more difficult to play close to the ground, to bend, to defend the sliced balls from the opponents that hit the glass. Nowadays, it happens more and more due to the high demanding competition and the exponential level increase in recent years. One has to get better and better at playing close to the carpet. For Shingoto, the short player you saw earlier, his 170 centimeters height helps him when playing at the back and returning low balls. It is obvious, isn't it? So why do we assume that two different players will play the same paddle? Will they follow the same logic? Even if they are in the same environment, there is a gulf of difference in personal constraints, how they are. This influences each player's path to success when competing. It was the same for Fosbury. His personal constraint was not the hate, but the personal discomfort jumping with what was normal at his time, the straddle technique. Environmental constraints are also largely responsible. Due to exponential growth, technological innovations, changes in the rules, today's paddle is not the same as yesterday. Yesterday's perturbations have nothing to do with today's. The player, a complex system, must find other foundations to have a stable performance. There is also another environmental constraint that has changed from one year to the next. Coelho has won from competing with the veteran Fernando Blasteguin to forming a partner with the young Agustin Tapia. The latter has a more adaptable physical condition has been key for Coelho when it came to feeling confident to move forward. Having a partner who you know is watching your back changes everything. Fosbury should also build a monument of gratitude to the environmental constraints, specifically the incorporation of surf surfaces and the mattress to land on. If you can land in a mattress, the worry about failing badly disappears. Dick was able to flow from jumping with scissors style to creating spontaneously the Fosbury flow. We can see the role that trust plays when breaking with what has always been done. In both cases, this confidence has been provided, I don't know to what degree, by the environment. It has been partly to blame for them of not being afraid to jump into the future in a way that no one had ever done before. And I'm not specifically talking about track and field. The same dependence on the context that has made Fosbury and Coelho reinvent themselves is what has prevented their previous colleagues from being the innovators. In Paddle, previous number ones like Velasteguin, Paquito or Lebron had not no problem being the best following the traditional game logic. They felt comfortable. So why change? On their way to the top, they encountered no perturbations that destabilized their successful performance. A different personal constraint, Coelho's hate, completely changes the context and asks for a new solution. However, the competitive level of the past was not, by a long shot, like the current one. Maybe players of Cuello's stature weren't as perturbed as he is today and didn't need to explore different ways to succeed. Could it also be coach's fault? Instead of providing context that fostered exploration, challenges, variability, have they made his players adapt to their closest model? Maybe we would have discovered the Cuello style sooner and it would have gone by another name. In the high jump, the best jumper was Valerie Brummer. He felt comfortable with the straddle technique. Same than before. Why change then? He had no need to do things differently. Only problems urge for problem solving and to be creative. However, the rules did not yet contemplate the matters to land. He had to fall 
on his face with his arms in front of him to protect himself. Landing from over 2 meters high, you can fall on your back. This already causes that, in that context, phosphory flock could not appear. Nobody asked for a new solution. That's why Coelho, like Fosbury, did not achieve his goals by following in the footsteps of those who did it before them. While the traditional style of play has been favorable to Chingoto or Velasteguin, just as it was to Valery Brummel in Haisham, it has played against Coelho, just as it happened to Fosbury. There was a need to break with the status quo and find his own way. Coelho has found stability of the high-level performance in the no-man's land, avoiding the low performance caused by the back of the court. This doesn't mean that this is Coelho's only stable functional behavior. Complex systems, thanks to multi-stability, can have more than one stable behavior. It usually happens, however, that the system shows preference for a particular one. Sometimes coaches and their love for overconstraining do more harm than good, but luckily, complex systems are goal-directed and adaptable. They have purpose that makes them adapt and evolve to satisfy it. Unlike computers, complex systems can do it alone. Spontaneously, nothing and no one organizes them. Fosbury wanted to jump higher. Coelho wanted to be number one. This made them self-organize in their own unique way to achieve their goals. The nonlinearity of complex systems is also largely to blame for this beautiful story. Changes might not be proportional. The same inputs might have very different effects. The same constraint can greatly affect Coelho's behavior, and not Chingoto's at all. Small differences between two players can cause very different behaviors. Ale Galan measures 4 cm less than Coelho and 16 more than Chingoto. Despite being closer to Coelho's stature, he plays more like Chingoto. Galan complex system has found his successful behaviors in this way. We cannot pay attention to the linear stimulus-response relationship because small constraints can largely change behavior when the system is close to a critical point, where what was stable until then becomes unstable. Coelho's path to becoming the youngest number one in the history of paddle has taught us that success often has more to do with letting the player express himself fully than molding him to the model that the coach wants. He found an attractor of successful performance in no man's land and changed the game for his opponents. When he stands there, the part of the court behind him disappears, making the court smaller for them. Coelho will make all the opponents better because he will force them to adapt to this new scenario that he proposes. I hope they thank him. Juan Malillo said that the regulations are the best tactics book ever written. Perhaps we should read less manual textbooks published by coaches who think they have the overall picture of how the game should be organized with players simply needing to comply his instructions. Maybe we should just look more at the rules and the game. These ones tell us to, above all, in paddle, pay attention to missing less and getting more winners than the opponent, but it doesn't delimit the model or the techniques to use to achieve it. Coelho's second great innovation has been a winner backhand shot, a black swan. It was assumed that only white swans existed until, in 1697, English colonists discovered a black swan in Australia and dismantled all existing scientific theories. Coelho, with his powerful backhand and the characteristic style of play mentioned above, has been the black swan of current paddle. Until today, most of backhand volleys were played slides to the glass or the fence or drop shot. Coelho arrived dressed as an English colonist and executed the backhand, kicking the bolt out of the court after bouncing in the back glass. I dare not to name the shot, only point to it. As Gabriel García Márquez said, it was so recent that many things lacked numbers, and to mention them, you had to point to them. I leave this matter of putting fixtures limits to reality and naming models to the status quo protectors 
and monkeys. You can watch his innovation at Fosbury Flop that blog. Like the English colonist, he dismantled all the theories that Padel played in a specific and closed way, that everything is made up, that the coach has all the answers and has nothing left to learn. As in the case of Fosbury, Coelho, playing in his style and executing this shot, shows us that, to be truly creative, is needed the rare confluence of personal, task and environmental constraints. Fosbury's invention emerged thanks to the confluence of the inclusion of the matters, his personality trait that caused him discomfort with the status quo, and his idiosyncratic preference to jump with the scissors style instead of a straddle technique. Behind Coelho's case, there is a perfect alignment of the three types of constraints. His personal characteristic, the constraints of the environment, and the demands of the game match perfectly. He created his own style of play in the no man's land and executing shocks like the mentioned in Banghart. Don't ask Chingot or Velasteguin, who does not have his power, hate, or the same dominant hand to execute the same shot. In his case, the personal constraints do not align with those of the task and the environment. He, the short player, will find another answer. He will be able to invent different shots in different situations. If we make him play like Coelho, because it's trendy or because it's the current correct model, we are going to fail. We will make him fail. The same with Dick. It teaches us how a rate-limiting constraint might be lifted to trigger exploratory behaviors and, as a result, the invention of a highly novel solution such as the Fosbury flop. It's not reasonable to pursue or sell the same optimal learning pathway for all learners. Solutions need to be dependent on the person, time and place. Learning pathways, thus, creation of performance solutions for a given movement task are individual. Competing in the Fosbury style, breaking with the status quo and with how Padel had always been played, Arturo Coelho found his stability. When the geniuses could express themselves as they were, they reached their maximum potential and changed the sport. Respect the players and the essence of the game. I remember when a status quo protector said of Arturo, I don't like Coelho because he can defend two balls in a row in the back part. Typically, the back part of the core is assumed to be the defense area. How can you say that he can defend two balls in a row if he's the number one? Of course he can. Another thing is that he doesn't do it in the way you like it, or that he doesn't follow the correct model you have in your mind. Your players be who they are. Don't be so selfish to make them be who you would like. The secret is to adapt to reality, your own one and that of the rivals. These geniuses weren't wrong, but ahead of his time. Paco Seirulo already warned us with a historic sport. Football is not something completely done, but something to be done. Well, imagine how much has left to evolve to paddle a sport that is just starting to take its first steps. Dick and Arturo, thank you for teaching us that we will never be able to capture paddle or any other sport, and that just because things are one way doesn't mean they can't be changed. It has been a great lesson for all of us who, at some point, have thought that we already knew everything, assumed that Padel was completely done, that everything was invented, or that there was nothing left to learn. My God, free us from being orthodox. Go to fosburyflop.blog to check the notes of the episode, its written version, and much more content. If you want to support the project through the website, you can make Fosbury Flop possible and check what benefits you get.